came out. Then they looking for trouble. Ran right up in the island. Now they back in the home. Now they know we can fight. Content give it every week. Me and Dr. Rip Shot. He won't bring you the heat. Now they know that we hit. And they know we quit. Yo, she by the chin. Keep on bringing it again. Unity, unity, unity. Cause they know we ain't stopping. And they know they got problems. And they ran out of options. We know we got a problem, can't let them go unsolved. Rain, rain, sun, Afrocentric history, we see tomorrow. Karma is karma, I see what I say, I hear the water. Till I see y'all fall off, then I bring y'all up on all the back up on my client winners. Client winners, 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 client winners. What up, though? What up, though? How's everybody doing? What up, though? I'm so glad to see everybody here. I know this is not another day. I'd like to welcome um, Seasons uh, Scales, Zachary Holmes, Blackbird, the Foundation, Joan Coromonte. Joan Coromonte, that is the woman. She helped me clarify. She helped me clarify caves. At first, I said that cave was culturally acquired immune deficiency syndrome. But what Joan did is that she, she brought to my attention, she's one of my patrons, 
She brought to my attention, no, 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 Dr. Winters, you have to have identity in there too. And so now I say, Cades is, you know, culturally acquired identity immune deficiency syndrome. Because when people catch Cades, they uh they lose their they lose not only their immunity to whiteness, they lose their identity. You know, the best example of this is the uh, is the is the uh, letter people. Many of the letter people, once they once they become a letter person, they believe that they're no longer black and they believe that they belong to the uh, dominant the dominant race. But we see uh, what happened to those people. We see what happened to those people in a sense who supported, uh, who came into that that uh, that war over there in the Middle East. Those letter people. One of the letter people, she was at a university and she was going to get a job for 200000 She thought she was white and they said, you're fired. You're not getting a job. Another letter person, they worked for the New York Times. They were writers. They were great people. But what happened? They lost. They lost their job. Why? Because they suffered from caves. They began to think that they were white instead of realizing that they were not white. No, they were still black people. Thank you for coming in. Oh, what's up, Sister Janice, my oracle? Thank you for coming in. Yet yeah, uh, that uh, that earlier video that was made by Yoshima the genius, and Yoshima the genius, what makes him such a genius is that he can help your business go to the next level. But again, thank you guys for coming in today. And uh, today is Thanksgiving, so I uh, always like to do a Thursday show. But uh, Dr. Matthews, Reverend Matthews, he had he had a family event today, so he can do it. So I'm doing a live. I only usually do one live. Uh, one live a month, but I'm doing another live today. Uh, later, I'm going to go and uh, be with my uh, my sons and my daughters, and and uh, we're going to uh, have a Thanksgiving dinner. You know, uh, hey, it's it's wonderful. You know, I thank my wife, my wonderful one, so much. I thank my wonderful one so much because she gave me children. She didn't have to give me children. She could have aborted them. She could have, in a sense, uh, decided to use birth control. But my wonderful one said, "You know what, Nick." Uh, I'm going to give you some kids because I think you need some. What? I came from a family of 11 children. Hell, I had to I had to sleep with somebody. I had to sleep with one of my little brothers until I got to be, what, 14 years old. And my, and my uh, oldest brother moved out and went to the military. Kids? Mm. But you know what? That was the best thing that she could have did for me because she allowed me to understand that, that I'm still loved. I'm still accepted. How you doing, uh, Dion Epps, uh, Yat, uh, Roland Hamid, and the Jules Suber? Again, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the bloody Halloween. Halloween is an important day, but uh, it's a, it has a strange history. And what I want to do is I want to talk to you about this history. I want to explain to you what and how we got into the place we are. Also, today I'm going to talk about the Baradanaks, you know. And the Baradanaks, those are the uh, foundational Black British people. And although, in a sense, we like to feel that okay, we're we're uh, distinct from everybody in the world. Yes, because of the fact that we have an African heritage, of course. You know, we also have an Aboriginal heritage from our Aboriginal, uh, you know, Indians who founded this place. But we also have, in a sense, a Baradanak origin. Many of us, many of our ancestors came from uh, came from the UK, and they were Black Irish. And they were sold as slaves. What's up, Yoshi, Yoshi Mod? Yoshi, the genius. The genius. Darlene X, thanks for coming in. Glad to see you guys. You know, and so again, as I said, is that this is a very interesting day, a very important day. But again, it's a day in a sense that has to be understood, and we have to really know what's going on. And so, what we're going to do is that uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, jump right into this. And uh, we're going to jump into uh, this uh, the uh, presentation. The reason uh, the reason I wanted to begin the presentation kind of early is uh, because the fact is that I'm I'm hoping that we can get through uh, you know in less than two hours. And then we can have some questions at the end. Bloody Thanksgiving, origins of the FBA mafia. You know, these are some of the incidents. We, when we think about the mafia, we think about the terrible catastrophe that we entered in. And that was our Holocaust. And this Holocaust, it didn't just take place in the United States. It also took place in the Caribbean. 
and many of the islands there, they suffered from all of these things. In fact, when you look at that picture up on the uh, top left-hand side, that, that was what they used to do in Britain to punish some of the black people in the Caribbean. They would boil them in sugar, you know? And so just think about the Bastilla. Think about the, the, the hate of these people. Think about how they treated the slaves. They did not treat us nice. You know, go to my Patreon to see the slides. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Clyde Winters 8. Uh, lately, I've been posting on Twitter and I've been uh, posting a lot of my uh, my shorts. I've been posting a lot of my uh, shorts uh, for YouTube on, on my uh, Twitter. Uh, also, you can follow me on TikTok.com at uh, Clyde Winters 3. This is my official TikTok site. Yoshimad and uh, and and Yoshimad. He's been a very wonderful person in the sense that he's, he's sent a lot of my videos to uh, TikTok. And in, in fact, I think uh, my videos on YouTube that relate to Dr. Winters, they've reached about five 500,000. That's great. But I'd like you, if you can, to, uh, if you go to TikTok, go to uh, Clyde Winters 3 and uh, follow me. There you can view some of my shorts. Uh, you can go to YouTube, where you're at right now, and you can... Uh, you know, you can look at my videos and deal with all aspects of history. Right now, if you would, why don't you just, you know, touch that uh, that like sign and, uh, you know, promote the uh, video. Also, you can order my books at Amazon.com. Uh, the presentation, to, this presentation is dedicated to one of my patrons. In this live broadcast, I will attempt to answer his question about FBA Black Europeans. This, uh, this question was sent to me by uh, Ralph. And now Ralph said, uh, greetings, Dr. Winters. Number one, would you please explain the difference between the black European physical features and the white? I can't do this in this essay, but what you in this presentation, but if you get my book, Origins of Black Neanderthals and the White Race, you can buy that at Amazon.com. That will explain the origin of, of Caucasian people. Is it possible that black Europeans is in reality the white man? Uh, this we'll discuss in this particular uh this presentation. Number three, is it possible that modern white man is not the original white man, as that term is applied today to a blonde-haired, blue-eyed creature? Again, get my book, Origins, Black Neanderthals and the White Race, Amazon.com, and this will answer that question, Ralph. Theoretically speaking, it was not possible for the modern-day white man to conquer the planet or, or, or certain lands without the original Black Europeans clearing a pathway for this to happen. That pathway includes several different types of strategic plans. I would explain the details of the concrete plans. Okay, the concrete plan that Europeans had was this. There was a volcano at, at Santorino. And the volcano at Santorino, what it did is that it opened up many of the uh, caves and Caucasians began, began to come out of the caves. As Caucasians spread across Europe, this tornado des destroyed or upset many of the black civilizations around 1400 BC, between 1400 and 1200 BC. As a result, they were able to come down and they went all the way to Egypt, then known as the people of the sea. And they went all the way to Egypt to try to conquer. Uh, the Egyptians, they defeated the uh, people of the sea and deposited them in Libya and some in Palestine. They were the uh, Philistines. But again, in a sense, yes, it's an intricate history. But if you want to get this history, Ralph and the rest of you guys interested in this, Get my book, Origin, Black Neanderthals and the White Race. Books to learn more about FBA Aboriginal Americans. You can get my book, We're Not Just Africans, and the History of Blacks in America from Prehistory to 1877. These books, in a sense, will allow you to understand the Aboriginal history. And uh, the uh, my book, The History of Blacks in America from Prehistory to 1877, it doesn't just stop at 1877. In fact, I discuss uh, you know, uh, foundation of Black American history all the way up until the, uh, you know, until the present. But I, but I give give special emphasis on the coming of the uh, black the uh, Black Europeans, the Baradinacs. I also, in a sense, uh, discuss in detail some of the Aboriginal history. So this book is very important if you want to get a full history of the uh, foundation of Black Americans. Uh, in January, I'm going to come out with a book that I'm going to deal with the uh, history, culture, and civilization of Aboriginal Black people. And the book I'm going to bring out in January, because I already brought out two or three books this year, so I'm not bringing out another one until January, God willing. 
And in the book that I'm going to bring out in January, I'm going to provide a detailed discussion of the uh, Aboriginal cultures, the Aboriginal civilizations, how we build pyramids. Yes, stone pyramids, mounds, etc. So, uh, but this book isn't coming out until January. If you want to find out information now, get these books. FBA is not a group. <clears throat> FBA is not an organization. FBA is a lineage. A lineage is lineal descent from an ancestor, ancestry or pedigree. As a result, we are descendants of the African and Aboriginal Blacks who built the United States. Thanksgiving origins of the Mafa. Mafa. Abadigani. That's us why he used to say hello. Abadigani, Mama, Abadigani, you know, sisters and brothers. Moff is a Swahili word meaning great catastrophe. The name Moff is used to describe the African Holocaust, the history and effects of the enslavement of Aboriginal Indians, Black Irish, and the transatlantic slave trade on FBA. Although Moff refers to the existence of FBA in the United States, it fails to explain the origin of the Moff in the United States. Moff, in relation to our experience in the United States, does not begin in Africa. It began here in the United States, where Aboriginal FBA and Black Irishmen were the first chattel slaves. You are prisoners of war. Yes, yes, yes. We are prisoners of war. What did, uh, what did Dr. Fuller teach us? Neely Fuller taught us that if you do not understand white supremacy, what it is and how it works, Everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Thank you, Nilly Fuller. He also said that the purpose for studying Black history is not to find out how great you were. It is to find out what mistakes were made that, that got us into this current situation. Very important. And see, that's what, that's what this, this video is about. This video, this, this broadcast, this podcast is about trying to get an understanding of how we got into this situation. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I mean, you think about it that these people, they came from over across the ocean. And when they came from across the ocean, they were able to dominate us and they were able to take over us. And they were able in a sense to rule us just like they ruled in Africa. But you know how they did that? They did that because we were not B1. We were not black first. We did not recognize in a sense that we were one people. And by being one people, we could have fought off those enemies. Yes, we did build our confederacies over here. We did build, We did try to, in a sense, build federations, uh, uh, states. But at the same time, in a sense, we would betray each other and we would sell each other out. Who are we and why are we here? You know, this is, uh, this is uh, from a letter that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, wrote while he was in jail. And this letter... The, the words in this letter are apropos for this moment. It's apropos for who you are and who I am. And what did he write? He said, before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before, before the pen of Jefferson etched the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forebears labored in this country without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters while suffering gross injustice and shameful humiliation. And yet out of a bottomless vitality, they continue to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our, na of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. Yes, yes, yes. Our demand, our demand is for freedom. Our demand is for justice. But as prisoners of war, we have to understand in a sense that they make limitations. But through the grace and mercy of God, Amma, Allah, Jehovah, Yahweh, through the grace and mercy of God, may, be, may God be a she or he. Through it's through God in a sense that, that foundational black Americans have been able to conquer and to overcome the cruelties and the injustice of this nation in this country. You got to remember, since we were the Aboriginal people in America, their intent was to destroy us like they did the Tasmanians. They wiped the Tasmanians off the face of the earth. 
They tried to destroy us too. <laughs> but we don't die. We multiply. That's right. That's right. This European, he came over here to destroy us. He came over here to take our land. He spread among us diseases. He put bounties on our heads so that we could be exterminated. And they did a good job in California, I'll admit. California, they did exterminate all the black people in California. But for the rest of us, those of us in the sense who came from the five civilized tribes, who came from those, those, those aboriginals that lived in the Midwest and lived on the Northeast shore, that lived in Cal lived in North Carolina and Virginia, we overcame and we multiplied. And we're here today. But we're here today because of the fact that we fight. We're here today because we recognize that white supremacy. Yes, yes, yes. They're powerful, but they're not powerful enough to destroy us. They're not powerful enough to keep us down. The British and Spanish began Indian slavery in the American Caribbean slave trade. The Spanish claimed Virginia and North Carolina from 1513 to 1670. These lands were not vacant. There were thousands of Aboriginal Blacks living on these lands. Over the years, these Aboriginal Blacks were joined by Black Irish chattel slaves and later Sub-Saharan Africans. It was in 1513 Juan Ponce de Leon landed along the east coast of North America. He named the territory Florida and claimed the area for Spain. From here, the Spanish traveled all the way to the American Southwest. Around 1526, the Spanish established a permanent colony in the Carolinas. But what happened to this, to this colony? We destroyed it, you know. Foundation of Black Americans and other people who were, who were in that colony, they ran the, British, the, the Spanish out of North American 1526. Yes, yes. The most successful Spanish colony was established at St. Augustine in 1565. St. Augustine is named St. Augustine, Florida today. The Spanish raided villages in North Carolina and Virginia and sold Black Indians as slaves, some as sex, as sex slaves in Europe. The Spanish attacked these houses and made the people slaves in the Southeast and North Carolina. Yes, yes, they, they kidnapped many, uh, many of our Aboriginal women and they made them sex slaves over in Europe. Yes, yes, yes. You know, because the thing is this is that they found them exotic because they were, they were first of all, they were Black. And uh, so this was something different. Just as the uh, Moors found exotic, those Ukrainian women that later turned, <laughs> that later turned uh, North Africa white. This is evident in the houses depicted by these Indians. The Aboriginal Blacks had many wars with the Spanish. Dr. Smallwood supports these wars with iconographic evidence of the houses built by the Black Indians who were hunted in North America to satisfy the Spanish lust for free labor to build their economy. They fought the Spanish for over 100 years. The Spanish were kidnapping Aboriginal Black women, as I said earlier, to be sold as slaves in Europe. You, this picture on the right-hand side, this is a picture of, of the uh, Spanish attacking some of the Aboriginal the Aboriginal, our Aboriginal ancestors, you see. If you notice, you notice that, that this was not in Mexico. We know that this was not in South America. And the reason that we know that this was not in South America or in Mexico is because of the longhouses. Yes, these are the longhouses. You know, back in the day, Aboriginal Black people, they built long, long, um, longhouses, log cabins. We're the ones that taught Europeans how to do it. And we usually put a wall or a palisade or, or some type of, uh, we built kind of like forts we built, would build a wall ab around it. But as you can see, the Spanish attacked many of, of our Aboriginal uh, ancestors. The Spanish were evil. They were vile. They were very cruel people. They hung our people. They sick dogs on them. They, let, they allowed dogs to eat them up. They were very inhumane. You know, the Spanish were people in a sense that were terrible and they were hated, but they were not welcome. Time Magazine tw in 2019, they had published an article called The First Thanksgiving Story Covers Up the All Too Real Violence in Early America. This is a quote from me uh, from this particular article. I quote, the hostile nature of European relations with indigenous people in North America began even before 1607, the year the English established a community in Jamestown. In 1598, the Pueblo residents of Acoma in modern New Mexico rebelled against Spanish attempts to coerce them into becoming subjects of a distant monarch. After the town's residents killed a dozen Spaniards, 
A large contingent of soldiers invaded the town, which had been occupied since the 12th century. After three days of brutal warfare, hundreds of Pueblos lay dead. The Spanish soldiers were or under orders from their commander, chopped off the right foot of every man over age 25, and enslaved men, women alike. They severed the hands of two Hopis with the idea that they would become walking advertisements for whatever happens to those who resist the conversation. Yes, yes. Here's a picture of, uh, of what they did. And now uh, this comes, this is another picture related to what they did to the uh, to our Aboriginal ancestors in North Carolina and Virginia. And again, in a sense, as you can see, they cut off their legs, they cut off their arms, they captured the women, and they sold them, you know, because uh, sex slaves. And, uh, and the thing is, this is that, this is what, one of the things you have to understand. Right now, and I tell everybody whenever I do a video, if you go to Google after this presentation, and if you put in if you put in Google slavery, if you put in in Google slave punishment, you're gonna you're gonna find hundreds of pictures that are gonna come up of white men beating black women. And the reason that they spent the time beating black women is that they always had this thing about they wanted, in a sense, to destroy our women. They wanted, in a sense, to keep our women down. They wanted, in a sense, to divide black men and black women from each other. And this has been a goal that they began 500 years ago and they continue today to do the same thing. Don't be fooled. The English knew much about North America before 1619. As early as 1490, the King of England spon sponsored the voyages of John Cabot to explore the Northeastern coast. Between 1508 and 1509, his son, John Cabot, mapped the coastline as far away as Chesapeake Bay. During British and Aboriginal FBA contact, the British usually spread smallpox. Yes, yes. You know, many of many many of the Aboriginals, they felt that a, that a good way when you meet someone is you bring them a gift. So the Europeans would bring them a gift. And what the British would do is they would give them a blanket. And these blankets would usually contain smallpox. And they 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 had a deliberate program of trying to kill off the Indians, you see. But the Indians, because of the fact that they weren't familiar with smallpox. African people, people in Africa, they were familiar with smallpox and they had a cure. But the uh, our Aboriginal ancestors, they didn't have a cure for smallpox. They didn't know how to, in a sense, fight the disease. And so they didn't know that, that when they took these blankets from the British, when they took these gifts from the British, they were really ticking time bombs. It was a way, in a sense, to use, you know, violence and at the same time, in a sense, to use a virulent disease to destroy a people. The first English colony was established in 1584 at Roanoke, modern Abermeyer Sound, North Carolina. The Aboriginal experience with the Spanish taught some Aboriginals to know the evil of the Europeans. So the locals completely destroyed the Roanoke, Roanoke colony. The most successful English colony was established in 1607 in Virginia. The Tusco Aurora claimed they destroyed the Roanoke colony. Four years before the pilgrims anchored off Massachusetts, British fishermen had already started making their way through New England, storming through Indian towns to kidnap native people for profit in the slave trade. By the time the British began to settle North America, many Indian communities had been wiped out due to disease. You know, many, you know, many people are always saying, hey, uh, you know, uh, especially some of our ignorant Abor Aboriginal brothers who, who listen to Dane Calloway, they keep saying that they that they they can't find any slave ships. He doesn't understand because he's not a researcher. He doesn't try to read the literature. He doesn't understand that any ship could be a slave ship. You see, here's an example of 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 a, of a slave ship when they had slaves, they had they had sugar, and then they had rum in the bottom. So, see, a slave ship could be any any ship. That you could put people on, you know that 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 depiction of, of how slave trip slave ships look. That's a now that that depiction I think was just made made up by propaganda, made up as propaganda by the uh, the abolitionists. But the average slave ship was just a regular boat, and you just you just cleared it out, made a made an area where you could put people in, and then you just would kidnap or by uh, African slaves. That's how they did it, or Irish, black Irish slaves. The Thanksgiving myth. The myth has it that, that the event that Americans commonly call the first Thanksgiving was celebrated by the pilgrims after their first harvest in the New World in November 1621. 
This alleged feast lasted three days and was attended by 90, 90 Native American Wapanak people and 53 survivors of the Mayflower, you know, the so-called pilgrims. This was a fake, this is a fake Thanksgiving st story. When the pilgrims landed in New England after failing to make their way to the, the milder mouth of the Hudson, they had little food and no knowledge of the new land. The Wapanox suggested a mutually beneficial relationship in which the pilgrims would exchange European weapons tree to the Wapanox for food. You see, this is not this is not some type of celebration. The Wapanox, they, they felt that, hey, I will hook up with these uh, British. But we're gonna we're gonna only in a sense trade with the British, allow them to live here as long as the British gives us guns because they wanted the guns. I'm sorry to say to kill all the black people, but hey, that was the that was the beginning of the black on black crime. With, with the help of an English speaking Patuachet Indian named Tisquartum, not Saquanto, he spoke English because he was kidnapped and sold in the European slave trade before making his way back to America. America. You know, they always teach you in the story, it was uh, Swako, Swak, Swakto, but it wasn't Swanto. You know, he uh, he was a, a runaway slave, but he was able to get back to America. The pilgrims reduced the bountiful supply of food that summer. For their part, the Wapanak were able to defend, defend themselves against the Narragansett. The feast of indigenous food that took place in October 1621 after the harvest was one of thanks but it is more not notably symbolized the rare peaceful coexistence of the two groups. Right, right. Usually in a sense, the Indians, we, the Indians had already remember what the Spanish had done to them. So they, they were in a sense, they were suspicious. They were suspicious of the English and the Dutch, but at the same time, because of the fact that they felt that the trade benefited them, they allowed these people to be in their lands, which was a big mistake. Thanksgiving was created to thank God for allowing whites to massacre us, blacks. The problem with Thanksgiving began because Dutch and English merchants wanted to take away black Native American dominance in the fur trade. Yes, it was about money. You know, it was about money. The whole idea of killing off black people, the black aboriginals, was about money. Whites hated black Indians. Naturally, the Dutch did not like this trade arrangement, you know, because the 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 the, the, the furs were mainly, in a sense, dominated by the Indians. They didn't like that. They wanted to take over the fur trade. They did not like the arrangement because the Pequot were becoming not only powerful but also richer and richer. By 1633, the English reached Pequot land along the Connecticut River. The English built a trading post at Windsor. The Montebesac welcomed the English. They saw the English as a group that could help them overturn the quad domination of the fur trade. So as you can see, it was always this dichotomy, you know? See, it was always, in a sense, black, you know, black tribes in the Americas, always trying to see how they could, uh, you know, beat another black tribe. You see, the European dominates the world, Ralph, and the rest of you out there, if you want to understand, he dominated the world because he played on our greed. He played on our greed. He played on our selfishness. He played on the fact, in a sense, that instead of recognizing that we were B1, we were one people under God, we always felt that because of our nationality, because of our tribal affiliations, that it made us a different people. And because that made us a different people, because this guy belonged to that tribe and the other guy belonged to a different tribe, we felt it was good to, in a sense, attack each other. We felt it was good to kill each other off because we felt that would benefit us. But it didn't benefit us in the long run. What it did is that it weakened us and it allowed Europeans, the English, the French, to take over the Americas. The Montebesic welcomed the English. They saw the English as a group that could help them overturn Pequot domination of the fur trade. By 1637, the English and Dutch wanted to put an end to the Pequot influence and power on the Connecticut River. In 1637, white colonizers turned on the Pequot. The Pequot tribe had taught them to farm take care of the land and raise food. The colonizers slaughtered 700 Pequot men, women, children, and elders, and then celebrated the rest who were sold into slavery. Yes, you have to understand, this was the real celebration. This was a celebration. This is when they began, in a sense, to thank God for allowing them to kill off black people. They did not 
in a sense, celebrate or thank, be thankful for two people working together, Indians, Aboriginal Blacks, and the Europeans. They were thankful because they could kill off the Black Indians. The Pequot were e was easily manipulated by the Dutch. To maintain dominance with their Dutch trading partners, the Pequot made war with the Nippon, the, Nim the Nimok, and the Matabesic people to keep them from being able to sell their goods to the Dutch. <laughs> Today, there's no such tribe as the Nimok and the Matabesic. Why? Because the dummies killed each other off. This event gave the Pequot total control of the trade. They soon forced the Matabesic to sell them their furs so the Pequot could be the only tribe to trade directly with the Dutch. The Dutch decided they did not like the Pequot domination of the fur trade because this allowed them to monopolize the fur trade and dictate the cost of furs. As a result, Jake, Jacob Elekins of the Dutch West India Company kidnapped the Pequot chief, Tatobim. Although the Pequot paid the ransom, Elekins kept the wampum and killed Tatobim. In, re in retaliation, the Pequot burned down the Dutch trading post. So as you can see, you know, money, money. You know, when they talk about money as the root of, root of all evil, yes, it is, you see, because it was through this greed, this desire to dominate one another that allowed our Aboriginal ancestors to lose their land, to lose this great country. The Pequot War was fought between the Pequot Indians against the English. The English were assigned by several Indian tribes who opposed the Pequots, including the Mohegans, you see. So again, so again, we see what? And again, we see that 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 we had the Pequot on one side, and then we had, in a sense, these other tribes like the Mohegans, you know, and other ones who joined the English. So you, you see how that that diabolical thing? Do you understand? See what you have to understand, family, is that the European could not take over America by itself. No, he couldn't do this because it wasn't enough. It wasn't a large enough number of them. What the European was able to do was that he was able, in a sense, to play on the desire of the various black tribes, their greed, to get them to work with them to fight and destroy other black tribes, you know. One of the major battles of the war was fought at a site called Mystic and led to the death of approximately 500 Pequots. Captain John Mason from Connecticut and Captain John Underhill from Massachusetts Bay Colony led the Puritan English groups who burned down a Pequot village in this battle. The day of Thanksgiving was to celebrate the murder of 700 black men, black men, children, and women. Yes, yes, don't get it twisted. The celebration, the first Thanksgiving, had nothing to do with the pilgrims in 1621. The first Thanksgiving took place in 1637. In 1637, after the massacre of the uh, Indians, the following day, the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony declared a day of Thanksgiving. See, these Europeans lie to you. They lie to you. The first Thanksgiving took place, you know, in 1637. And that was when the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony declared a day of Thanksgiving. The children and women over 14 were made slaves. The rest were murdered. The militia and Dutch mercenaries were paid were paid for the Pequot scalps. Yes, yes, he, the European, he was the one who began the scalping, you know, that, you know, he began the scalping. They always tell you that in the in the cowboy movies, oh, Indian come, Indian, he scalp them, white man. No, it was the Europeans who was doing the scalping. It wasn't Aboriginals. The men were sold into slavery beginning from this date for many years. 500 black Indian slaves were regularly sold into slavery in the Caribbean or worked on farms in other parts of New England. But it's very important to understand that, let me explain to you how the situation occurred, that the European, because of fact, in a sense, that he knew that he could not keep, the, he could not really trust many of the Aboriginal men to be, you know, be good slaves. What he did in a sense is that he would usually sell most of the men to the Caribbean, Bermuda, Jamaica, places like that, and in a sense, the women and the children, those would be put on plantations in the 13 colonies because of the fact in the sense is that they could be controlled. Well, and in fact, when you really think about it, many of the uh, many of the slave rebellions in the Caribbean were led by 
Aboriginal foundational Black American men who continued to fight to be free when they got to the Crimean. See? But they didn't, they didn't have any boats and they didn't know how to get back to North America. So again, I'll repeat is that they would use the innocent, sell most of the men, sell them into slavery, into our uh, Jamaica Bermuda, and on the plantations, they would uh, they would assign these uh, Aboriginal women and the children. See, this is a very important thing to remember because I'm going to come back to this point later. John Mason, commander of the Connecticut forces, wrote that, and I quote, and thus, in little more than one hour's space, was their impregnable fort with themselves utterly destroyed to the number of six or 700, as some of themselves confessed. Yeah, remember, you know, they built forts, but they lost. And, and the reason they lost is that when the European would attack, he would use the attack, the African villages, just like the, uh, just like the people of the nine, when they would attack uh, African villages in Africa, the uh, Europeans, they would attack the villagers around 4 a.m. in the morning, you know, while the people were asleep. And in this way, in a sense, he could catch them off guard. And this is very important to remember is that the European, he was a master, in a sense, of trichology. What I mean by a master of trichology is that he would convince you that he was your friend. He would convince you that he was your partner. And then he would stab you in the back. Black Native Americans were loaded on ships for sale in the West Indies. Yes, yes, yes. Every time Black Indians were massacred was a day of Thanksgiving. So whenever Blacks were put into slavery or killed off, it was a day of Thanksgiving. Over the following years after this war, the English made other successful raids against the Pequot. Every victory was declared a day of Thanksgiving. I repeat. Over the following years after this war, the English made other successful raids against the Pequot. Each victory was declared a day of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving didn't begin in 1621. That's a myth. Thanksgiving began whenever Europeans could find some black Indians and kill them. The English felt that to bring them more success in the colony, they should massacre the black the black, the blacks, and make them their slaves. At Stanford, Connecticut, in the churches, they pronounced the second day of Thanksgiving. During the celebration of fit and feasting, the heads of the Pequot were hacked off and kicked down the streets. It was George Washington who instituted a single day of Thanksgiving, because see, they were always having Thanksgiving whenever they killed black people. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that that they that they had cut the Pequot's heads off? And they were playing, playing soccer with them in the streets, kicking them down the streets. These colonial people were very evil. These colonial people were very cold. You see? It's just so interesting to me that when you read about these colonizers, these settlers, when you read about the fact that they had no feelings and, and, they, and that they, they just saw anybody that wasn't part of their group they saw them as, 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 as worthless. They saw them as being less than an animal. But this is what these our Aboriginal ancestors experienced. And even though they experienced this, even though they saw these things, they still would join with Europeans, the British, the Dutch, the French. They would join with them to attack other, uh, other, other tribes. It was hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of Aboriginal Black tribes but today, they're very few. And the reason they're very few is because the European was successful. He was successful in allowing these Aboriginal people to feel that they could, in a sense, overcome each other. And that by working with the European and knocking out their brothers, then they would be the dominant force. But every time, in a sense, these Black tribes would, would join the British, would join the French to attack another group, then they would, in a sense, in turn, get another Black tribe to work with them to attack that group. But Thanksgiving was a time to celebrate the murder of black men, the murder of black women, the murder of black children. Puritan thanks God for being able to massacre the Pequot and other Aboriginal FBA. The English, the English colonists gave thanks for the massacres they had just carried out against the black Aboriginals. In 2019, a Time Magazine stated, I quote, according to the Plymouth governor, William Bradford, 
Armed soldiers surrounded the Pequot village and set it on fire. The flames destroyed the Pequot's weapons, homes, and families. Colonists shot at those who tried to escape. Bradford believed the soldiers killed 400 people. John Winthrop, the governor of Massachusetts, estimated the total of these murdered during the war or captured and enslaved totaled 700. I quote, it was a fearful sight to see them thus frying in the fire and the steam and the streams of blood quenching the same. Bradford memorably wrote of the terrible night, but the deaths were a sweet sacrifice, a phrase from Leviticus, for which the colonists gave the praises thereof to God. Again, God, God, they see, they see God as vengeful. They see God as, as their weapon to keep a brother down. They see God as, as that power that allows them to dominate us, to overcome us. And what did they say? What did that governor say? Governor Bradford said it was a sweet sacrifice. Do you understand? Do you understand that every time, every time a European, every time in a sense, a white person kills another in a sense, kills a black person, it's like a sacrifice. It's like that sacrifice. It's like they're showing God that they have that power. You see, your murder is a sacrifice for them. I continue. Six years later, warfare tore out, tore apart the Dutch colony of New Netherlands. That's, you know, modern New York City. Governor William, William Kiff, eager to destroy indigenous resistance to the colony, ordered assaults on sites where Munsi speaking peoples had sought sanctuary. In a single night, according to one colonial witness, Dutch soldiers made, murdered 80 refugees at Pavonia. In a tragic echo of the, brutal, of the brutality at a coma, the soldiers also apparently sliced off the hands or legs of some of their victims. They sliced off the hands or legs of some of their victims. Near Stanford, an English military veteran of the 1637 war who had offered his service to the Dutch or the soldiers that fired to a tan Kentucky town, killing almost 700 in an hour. Where is the tan? Where is the tan Kentucky today? Where are they? Where's the, where's the Munsi people? Where are they? They're dead and they're gone because they didn't stick together. They weren't B1. They weren't B1. If, if they would have stuck together, they could have wiped out that European colony. They could have wiped out that Dutch colony. But no, they didn't do that because they felt in a sense that because they belonged to the Muncie nation or they belonged in a sense to the Tankateki nation, that okay, they were safe, they were okay. But they were only safe until the European decided that they wanted their land too. When the European decided that they wanted their land, they went and they did what? They took it. They took it. And they were able to take it because these people are not B1. When I tell you every week, when I tell you that we must be B1, we must be black first. When Professor Black, when he tells you we must be B1, we must be black first. He's not joking. He's not joking. That's the only way that you can defeat white supremacy. Every time I think about our Aboriginal ancestors who refused to stick together, and stay together to fight Europeans that gave up our land. They gave up our land by not being B1. The English did not just murder the Pequot. The Wapanak, remember I told you about the Wapanak? They were the ones who in 1621 taught the uh, taught the English how to how to how to survive, taught them how to plant. You know, because see, uh, many many people don't know that the pilgrims. Uh, before the, the Wapanak taught them how to uh, how to farm, do you know that they were eating the dead? Yes, yes. The first Europeans, they dug up the graves of dead people, or they, in a sense, anybody who died, they would eat them. They ate each other. They were cannibals. Yes, yes. But then, you know, the, the Wapanak told them how to, in a sense, farm and grow. But let's continue. The Wapanak who taught the British how to exist in America belonged to the Algonquin Confederacy, the League of the Delaware. Although English had a treaty with the Wapanak, their king was beheaded. Yes, they cut the king's head off. And after they cut the king's head off uh, for 24 years, the impaled 
Keith's head was displayed on a pole at Plymouth, Massachusetts. Think about that. Here's a picture of the Wapanak King. They cut his head off and they stuck his head on a pole and his, and his head remained on that pole for 24 years. Can you think of that? A head rotting in the street for 24 years? But these are the type of beasts that we're dealing with. In fact, in fact, on most plantations in the South, they used to, in a sense, have a have an, uh, have a an, uh, an, uh, a black man, well, a, a strong, one of the strongest black men on the plantation. They would kill him, cut off his head, and they would have put his head on a pole or hang it or hang it in a tree at the entrance into the plantations. And they would let these these heads remain on that pole or remain in that tree until they rotted, just to let people understand that slavery was about was not about innocence bull. Slavery was about maintaining authority. It was about creating terror and, and, in a sense, hurting the people who were slaves. This is a great example of how the English were able to use divide and rule tactics to take control of America. It is interesting that the Pequot, before their war with the British and Dutch, was happy to subjugate other Black and Mongoloid Indians so they could greedily take control of the fur trade. This was not the end of the story. Over time, the British took the Mohegan and the Narragansett lands too. Yeah, yes, the Mohegans and the Narragansett, they had joined with the British to fight, in a sense, the Pequot. Where's the Mohegan today? Where the Grant, where the Nar <laughs> where's the Narragansett tribe today? Bah, they're gone. They're gone. Black unity will get you destroyed, B1. Today, due to the betrayal of the Black Indians to each other, they are a minuscule people in New England and other parts of the USA. Many continue to promote disunity by denying their African ancestry and promoting their ethnicity instead of being B1. Here's some of the uh, the uh, survivors of the Pequot tribe, you know. There's a few of them still uh, uh, along. Today, most of the uh, Pequot, they've joined the, the Lenape, the Lenape people, you know. See, the European, he was, he was very careful. He always, in a sense, had a, had a buffer, a buffer population. So what he did is that he, he would always put the, uh, the the red Indians, you know, use them as a buffer between the black Indians. And as a result, in a sense, he would he would uh, promote them on the red Indians, to hunt down other black, hunt down their their their, uh, their fellow people. But see, the red Indians, they only got they only in a sense got over here because formerly there were buffalo in Virginia. There was buffalo in North Carolina, Mississippi, all those states they had buffalo. And so what happened is that you know the uh, the red the red Indians. They were a nomadic people. You know, they lived in teepees. And so these red, the, the red Indians, they migrated, they migrated following the buffalo. And then when they came, when they came to, to the uh, northeast and they came to the southeast, they already found the uh, black tribes, the uh, five civilized tribes and other tribes, and they adopted them. And they adopted these red men because they were hunter gatherers. So they adopted them and they were able in a sense to, to help supply them with food, and they would supply them, in a sense, with uh, you know, with meat from hunting buffalo and other things. But see, over time, the Europeans saw that as as a great wedge. They felt, aha, we'll hook up with the uh, we will hook up with the red man because see, Benjamin Franklin he felt that it would be profitable for Europeans, the English, to mate with the red people. And the, and the reason he wanted them to uh, mate with the uh, red Indian is that he felt that the red Indian. Could uh, could survive better in a sense, and and would be able in a sense to be able to depigment much earlier. It might take maybe three generations to depigment, you know, uh, the uh, the Aboriginal blacks. But you know, they could use in a sense mate with a red Indian, and then the, the child the child have them mate with another white person, and before you know it, they could just wipe out any uh, any evidence of them being uh, being Indian. And so they saw red Indians as a way to keep America white. The English, French, and Dutch provided the Native Americans with guns, rum, and cheap goods to purchase Native American Indian slaves between 1670 and 1720. Many uh, Black Native Americans were enslaved. The Black Native Americans were sold in slavery throughout the 13 colonies, Mississippi Valley, Canada, and the, to the, Bre and the West Indies. The majority of Black Native Americans sold in slavery by the whites and Indian slave traders were Choctaw, Yamasee, and other Carolina tribes. Yeah, they were minorities like some of Narragansett, all that. But they, in a sense, 
you know, the Choctaw was a much larger tribe and the Yamasi was pretty large. So they could kind of piece them away. And then other black groups, as, as I know, as I've already talked, these other smaller tribes, they would just dominate them. Anytime they needed some slaves, they would just go attack a, a black village, kill all the men if they could, or, or the survivors, they would either in a sense send the men to uh, to the Caribbean or they would uh, keep the women and children to work and grow tobacco and sugar, you see. Remember, sugar, tobacco, they had already, when they came over, they had already found the European that it was the women working the fields. So they felt in a sense that it would be more profitable for them to keep the women, the Aboriginal women, to work on the plantation and only a few men, but not too many, but they would mainly keep the women. And in that way, in a sense, they could make sure that they could dominate the uh, the enslaved people and keep them some, maybe uh, submissive, hopefully. The Tuscarora lived in North Carolina and Virginia. The name Tuscarora comes from the word Skyrek, which means hemp people. Their oral traditions claim that they root an area extending from the Piedmont Mountains to the sea. The Tuscarora were divided into two major groups in colonial Carolinas. And you can look at this map. And when you look at this map, in a sense, you can see the upper Tuscarora and the lower cost, um, Tuscarora, you know. And so in a, in a sense, you can see on the other side, you know, the tri-racial origin of North Carolina and Virginia, 1587 to 1711. It, uh, it talks about many of the uh, communities in which these various Tuscarora and other uh, Aboriginal Black tribes live. You know, there were many uh, Native American language groups in North Carolina, Virginia, before 1492. You had the Algonquin and the Iroquois. And, and Iroquois. It's very important to understand that the Algonquin and Iroquois, these were not separate tribes. The Algonquin, that was a confederation or a group of, uh, a group of uh, in a sense, Aboriginal tribes that belonged to that particular confederation. And the Iroquois, the Iroquois, that was not a tribe. The Iroquois, they were a confederation of another group of uh, another group of uh, black people. On this map, in a sense, you can see where they had, in a sense, the Algonquins. You see, and we can see, you can see Lake Superior. You can see uh, all the way in the Midwest because see many of the uh, many of the black tribes, you know, had affiliates not only on the East Coast but all the way out on, out into the uh, Midwest. Yes, yes, yes. You know, today, in a sense. You find many, uh, many Red Indian people. These Red Indian groups who claim to be Illinois and Wisconsin. Well, well, those people, they're not the real, they're not the real or the original, in a sense, Indians that lived in the Midwest. In fact, they're not, most of them are not the original Indians that dominated the Southeast. You know that most of the Indians in the Southeast, they, they were moved out in 1831, remember? During the Trail of Tears. But what they did is that the white man, just so he could have a buffer group, he would allow he would allow groups of red Indians to live in certain areas of the South and the Midwest and whatever. And he allowed them in a sense to adopt our tribal names. See, they're not the original tribal people that lived in those areas. They just allowed them to adopt our tribal names. So they could pretend in a sense that the red men were the original Indians when they were not the original Indians. They were not the Aboriginal or indigenous people. The indigenous people of America, the Aboriginal people of America, were the copper colored people who they describe, who the Europeans described as black. You know, some of my uh, some of my uh, Aboriginal brothers, they say, Dr. Winters, why did you why do you keep saying that they were African? Dr. Winters, you know, why wh what what was wrong with uh with Dr. David Mhotep, uh kind brother, may may uh, he rest in, in glory on the other side. We said it because the fact is this is that the only way that we know these these Aboriginal tribes were black people is because the Europeans, they would call them copper coat and then they said they were, they would describe them as being blacks, blacks. They used the word black. And because they used the word black, that's how we know that the Aboriginal people in a sense were black people. If the European didn't call them black and said they were black like Africans or, or black like, you know, they called Africans Negroes back then, black like the Negroes, then we wouldn't even know that there were Aboriginal Black people in this country. The Tuscarora, the major Tuscarora tribe was called the Manahuac. They lived in the northern Piedmont Mountains of Virginia. According to Professor Awen Smallwood, John Smith made a map which shows some of the Indian tribes. 
as you can look on this map, if you look on this map of Virginia, you can see some of the pictures of the tribe. The uh, map on the left gives you a, a, a big di diagram of of the uh, of the area. But then, but then, but then, in a sense, the map on the right, we have we look at specific areas. If you look up in the uh, left and the right, in the left hand corner, you can see the mining cans. And then you can, and then if you look on the uh, on the uh, right, just as the just under the corner, you can see the mana ox, mana ox. So uh, look at that. Take a look at that map for a minute. Okay, the Manahoac were related to the Manico or the Monacan Indians of Virginia, but the Monacan Indians, <laughs> they didn't call themselves Monacan. That's what the European called them. They called themselves Manican. I repeat, they called themselves Manican. You see, this indicates that they were a Mandy-speaking people because we still find the Manican people in our West Africa. See, that's why. That's why when a lot of times when when a lot of my Aboriginal brothers are trying to run away from their African ancestry, trying to say, don't stop calling me black. You're called black because of the fact that in a sense is that that's how we know that you existed because the Europeans said you were black phenotypically, you see. We know that there were Africans over here because just like you found the Manican tribe in Virginia and you can see the Manican, look up there on that back, see the Manican in that right, in the, in the uh, left-hand corner of the map on the right. But see, they called themselves Manican, and the Manican, in a sense, indicates that they were Mandy speaking people because we also find the Manican over in Africa today. The Manican or Manican people are also related to the Okanishi and the Sapani people located in present day North Carolina. These tribes lived in long houses. Again, do you see here's, an, uh, here's a Manican village? If you notice, we, you see the long houses. See? You know? Think about that. Look at look at that picture on the right. This is how our villages looked back in the day. See? But instead of them telling you that this is how Aboriginal black people lived in houses, they want to make you they want to make you believe that all that the that the American Indians lived in teepees. Well, that was the red man lived in the teepee because they were nomadic. We were not nomadic, we were sedentary people. We built houses because we stayed in one place. We didn't move around all the time. You see? The Tuscarora controlled the trade in valuable lands in these colonial states. They are very prominent in the trade of purple wampum. Wikipedia noted that wampum, and I quote, it includes white shell beads, hand fashioned from the North Atlantic, channeled whelk shell, and white and purple beads made from the quahog, or Western North Atlantic hard shell clam. In 1710, the Tuscarora attempted to immigrate to Pennsylvania to get away from the English colonists who were stealing their land and enslaving their people to work on the British plantations. Other tribes joined the Tuscarora tribe and fought the British to protect their people from slavery between 1630 and 1710. This is almost 100 years of war. Yes, yes, almost 100 years of war trying to keep their people from being enslaved, you see? But instead of them just all united just saying, hey, we're going to knock all the, the, the Caucasians, Europeans out of the country, they would just wait until they attacked them and then they would say, okay, we peace, we had not a peace treaty. Then after a while, the Europeans would attack them again until, until they slowly wore them out, until they slowly decimated them. By 1711, the Tuscarora grew tired of the abuse of the colonists, and they began the Tuscarora War. The war was based on the fact that the Tuscarora Indians were being enslaved by the British. Due to the colonists' desire to make black people slaves, there was considerable interactions between the Tuscarora and the chattel black Irish and sub-Saharan African slaves. This led to considerable intermarriage between these three populations. Again, as I, as I told you, a lot of times they would put, they would try to kidnap the uh, the Indians, you see, and then they would they would they would put them on plantations. But in addition, many of the uh, Black Irish and the Sub-Saharan Af African slaves would run away, and when they would run away from the plantation, they would join up with with African with Black tribes. Like Aboriginal tribes like the Tuscarora. So after a while, the Tuscarora was very mixed. The Tuscarora had, in a sense, people among them of Black Irish ancestry, Sub Saharan ancestry, and they're all mixed up. That's one of the reasons why, just like myself, you know, I'm Choctaw. My, my, from my mother's side, I'm Choctaw. My father, in a sense, from the, vent, from the winters, that's a whole different story, you see. 
you know, but but we were all bunched together on those plantations. See, and then and then in addition to being bunched together on the plantations, the European refused to call. They after after they after they slowly got to know black Indian tribes, they refused to recognize black Indian tribes, and they would always describe black Indian tribes as free colored, and they would in a in a sense try to promote the red people as as Indians. It was very diabolical. The colonists slowly stole Tuscarora land. The Indians got tired of this abuse and decided to go to war. They killed British and German colonists. On the 22nd of September, 1711, after the Battle of Hancock Fort in March, 1712, they agreed on a peace treaty with South Carolina in May, 17, in May 1712. The North Carolina people attacked the Tuscarora when they met to ratify the peace treaty. Many other Tuscarora were murdered and 200 Indians were made slaves. Again, as I said, the European, that's why the European is called an Indian giver because he would uh, he would make a treaty with you and then he would, in a sense, you know, never fulfill the terms of the treaty. So he was, an, he was what? He was an Indian giver because he would say he was giving you something and then he would take it away. And so many of the uh, Tuscarora joined the Iroquois Confederacy. Again, as I told you, when they talk about Iroquois, that's not, an, an, that's not an Aboriginal tribe. The Iroquois was a confederation of a number of tribes that came together. In December 1712, Colonel James Moore, with, thir with 33 whites and 1,000 Native Americans, defeated the Tuscarora. As you can see, the whites were all, always able to get Aboriginals to help them defeat their brothers. Think about that. Think about that. It was only 33 whites, but they was able to get a thousand black, thousand Native Americans, black and Mongoloid Indians, to attack the Tuscaroras. See, in this picture on the right, on the in this picture on the right, they try to show you, and it says mainly Europeans, Caucasians, but we also see on the other side, you know, the Indians. And so, so they were able, in a sense, to always have us fight each other, fight each other. That's why every week. Every week when I do a presentation, I always tell you we have to be B1. If we want to overcome the enemy, we have to be B1. We are prisoners of war. We're prisoners of war. You got to get that in your head. See, we did not immigrate here. We did not, we did not in a sense, come here on our own free will to be slaves. We were, we were enslaved or we were declared colored people by our enemies, the settlers. In the battle, in the battle, they killed 900 warriors and made many Tuscarora slaves. These slaves were sold into slavery in the Caribbean and plantations throughout the colonies. The war lasted until 1715. After the war, the Tusca Tuscarora joined the Iroquois in New York. They became the sixth nation of the Iroquois Confederacy. You see what I'm talking about? See, the European Caucasians, they could not have taken over America if not for the fact that Indians, Black Indians, fought against each other. Why are we so easy to betray each other? Why are we so easy, it, in, instead, instead of sticking together as one group, instead of being B1, we got to always, in a sense, join our enemies in destroying each other. Very sad state of affairs. The Mongoloid Indians who helped the British were later put on reservations. The Tuscarora were forced to live on the Indian Woods Reservation. Many other people in Indian Woods today are descendants of the Tuscaroras. That's in, uh, I think, North Carolina. <laughs> they lost their land because they had to sell their land to the very governments over the years to pay their taxes. Yeah, see, see the European, he was slick, you know. He was say, uh -huh, you can, uh, you can go live on this land. But then every year they would come and say, well, now time to pay taxes. Uh, you didn't have a job. He said, okay, well, instead you have, you can pay taxes by giving us part of your land. And then eventually he was still all the land that, that even gave the, uh, gave the, uh, the aboriginals as a reservation. He was still, still their land by, by taking away their land for them to pay their taxes. See? Those, canal, those, those colonists were dirty, 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 vile people. Once black Indians lost their land, they were classified as colored people and were made slaves. Some children were taken from the Indians by county courts. This is the Tuscarora. 
These courts in the 1800s would indenture the Aboriginal youth as sailors, etc., from age 8 to 25. See, not only did they make the Tuscarora and other blacks in North Carolina, you know, colored colored uh, people in North Carolina, that's what they called the black Indians. They didn't want to call them by their tribal names. They called people. To, to, to keep control of the colored people, even though they made it look like you were really independent and free, they would take their children and then they would, they would make their children indentured. They'd make them indentured servants and they would have to wait, work from the age of eight years to 25 years, see? They either made you a slave and then when they didn't make you a slave, they would just make you an indentured so that was still a slave. Just think if you had, if you had to work for, for almost 20 years before you could be a be a free a free color that's a damn shame but that's the european that's what happens when you don't stick together that's what happens when you live under white supremacy and you refuse to be b1 b1 black first dr marie charles oh wow dr marie charles is an angel you know dr charles in her latest edition of of the uh infant missing faces in teaching, she she she's taught us that 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 the names of, of 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 enslaved Africans did not come from their slave masters. These were our native names that came from our ancestors, black Irish, black Scotsmen, black Welsh, who were sold into slavery. Yes, yes, yes. Our name, our surnames, did not come from our masters. Benjamin Franklin. Circa 1751-8 D warned about German immigrants as the sons of Africa and their swarthy complexion, which was an affront to the purely white people who originally settled in America. What? Wait, wait, wait a minute. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? What, what Benjamin Franklin talking about? Oh, white! Right. Oh, white! Right. And he said the Germans were the sons of Africa, but oh, what's the name of that that that, that, uh, that actor? Uh, he played as a as a bar as a barbarian, and he played as a terminal. Yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger. What? Wait, wait. Oh, now I understand. Arnold Schwarzenegger. What does his name say? He's Arnold the Schwartz, the black Niger the nigger. He's Arnold the black nigger. Yes, 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 yes. Sir. Just because they have pale skin today, we can see that originally. Benjamin Franklin said the Germans look like the sons of Africa. There's the Hessian soldier on that right-hand side. I quote, why should Pennsylvania founded by the English become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous to Germanize us instead of anglicizing them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion? This is crazy. This is crazy. It was so beautiful. I love Dr. Marie Charles. I love the knowledge she gave us, but she upset the whole damn historical experience. You don't tell me that the Europeans, a lot of them were, were black? Black? Not black. But they were. See? Arnold Schwarzenegger, today, he, 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 he looks like any other normal white person, but his name shows that he was informed that his ancestors were what? Black niggas, Schwarzenegger. But let's continue with what Benjamin Franklin wrote in 1751, which leads me to add one remark, that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionately very small. All Africa is black or tiny, Asia chiefly tiny. America exclusive of the newcomers, wholly so. In Europe, the, Span the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, and Swedes are generally what we call a swarthy complexion, as are the Germans also. also. The Saxons only accept it, who with the English make the principal body of white people on the face of the earth. I could wish their numbers were increased. And while we, while we are, as I may call, call it, scoring our planet by clearing America of woods and making this side of our globe reflect a brighter lighter, brighter light to the eyes of inhabitants in Mars or Venus. Why should we inside of the superior beings darken its people? Why increase the sons of Africa 
by planting them in America, where we have so fair an opportunity by excluding all blacks and tunnies of increasing, increasing the lovely white and red. See how he puts white and red? That's because he he, he loved the uh, he saw the red Indians as a people that he could, you know, mate with and make make more white people uh, faster. But again, I continue. But perhaps I'm partial to the complexion of my country. Yes. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. Do you, do you see how people like Benjamin Franklin, because of the fact that he, he had that pale complexion, he unified with other pale people, and they were able, in a sense, to unify to keep out these black people. It's hard to, it's hard to believe that. It's hard to believe that, but let's continue. The British government allowed slave traders to kidnap Irish and other blacks Blacks in Scotland. During the 12 years of oppression of the Irish, Cromwell sold thousands of, of, of Irish slaves. If you want to find out more about the Black Irish in, in the Americas, you need to get my books, Black History Gems, Essays, Volume 1. In this book, I talk about some of these early, these early, in a sense, Black Europeans. And definitely my book, History of Blacks in America, from Prehistory to 1877, I give you an entire chapter on the Baradanacs, those uh, those black those black Irish Scots and Welshmen that were sold over here as, as chattel slaves. I repeat, they weren't indentured servants. You know, Dane Dane uh, Calloway always wants to talk about all oh, these people are indentured servants. The black Irish were not indentured servants. The black Irish were chattel slaves. That means personal property. If you want to find out more about these uh the Baradanacs and the blacks in and the blacks in Europe, get my book, get my book, Blacks in Europe, from prehistory to contemporary times. You can get my book, The World History of the Black Race, where I talk about black people on every continent that ever existed. And you can get my book, The Manufactured Genetic Origins of the Fake Eurasian Black Migration. In all three of these books, I discuss. The Baradanaks, I discussed those black people who formerly lived in Europe. Oliver Cromwell can be credited with the exile and extermination of many blacks in Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. Cromwell, in his war to reconquer the Irish, sent black Irish to the Caribbean and 13 colonies in America. And this is what he said he sent them to perpetuity as slaves. I repeat, in the parliament, Cromwell made it clear that he was sending the black Irish to the Caribbean and the 13 colonists to perpetuity as slaves. That means to be forever slaves on the sugar plantations. Very few black Irish were indentured servants. As the Battle of Worcester, 10,000 Welch were sent into slavery too. There's a picture of Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell saw slavery as a perfect way to remove the Catholic blacks from Ireland and Scotland. You know, Cromwell, he was a Protestant. See, that's one of the reasons why today I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't recognize any religion. I just say I believe in God because it's it's religions that also separate people on this planet. You know, because of our so-called religious belief and and following this faith or that faith or this preacher or that or that imam or that uh, kohen or that rabbi, this is what leads us into trouble. See. And this is what Oliver Cromwell, because he was a, was a Protestant, he hated all the Catholics. And the vast majority of, 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 of Black people in Ireland, Wales, and Scotland were Catholics. Cromwell usually worked with Bristol merchants to sell many Irish into slavery. Between 1651 and 1654, 34,000 of four, the 40,000 Irish Roman Catholics were sold as slaves. Cromwell forced many Black Irish to serve in his army. Instead of freeing these Blacks, Black Irish men were forced to serve as mercenaries. They were sold by Cromwell to be placed in armies across Europe, especially France and, and Spain. Oliver Cromwell was made to appear white in history books to deny that Blacks ever ruled, ever ruled the United Kingdom. On the left-hand side, we have an actual, an actual painting, actual picture of how Oliver Cromwell looked. But if you notice, they make they have a fake picture of Oliver Cromwell on the internet, and although he although he slightly although he slightly in a sense uh, favors the real Crom, Oliver Cromwell photo, if you notice, they want to make him look 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 more palish, more 
Caucasoid, as opposed to the actual uh, picture of uh, of Oliver Cromwell that shows his uh, his African and Negro ancestry. Many of the Irish slaves were women and children sent to Barbados and the 13 colonies. For example, 50,000 Irish slaves a year were sold to the New World between 1652 and 1656. Black Scotsmen also were sold as slaves. There was an estimated 200,000 Black Irish sold into slavery between 1651 and 1660. We, you know, that's why the, 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 uh, the numbers always vary. That's why you, you see contradictory numbers. That's because when they wrote this stuff, it all, they always varied. The Black Irish sold into slavery between 1651 and 1660. The Black Irish were replaced by whites from England who were given the land to settle in Ireland. See, whenever they talk about the Irish migration, in a sense, to America, they, they usually talk about the Irish, the white Irish, who came to America as a result of the potato famine. Yes, they came. These were white Irish that came from, in a sense, Ireland during the potato famine. These Irish, these Irish, in a sense, were the former serfs or, or the poor people that worked for the uh, black Irish people who were sold into slavery, you see? See, because Oliver Cromwell, he mainly wanted to get, get rid of the black elites, the black Irish elites and the black Irish period. And he didn't mind in a sense those, those white Irish to remain in Ireland because they were weak, they didn't have anything, but he allowed his soldiers to take over the lands and the names and heritages of those black Irish that he sold into perpetuity as slaves. Many Blacks who live in the United States today have a direct European heritage. This class of FBA would mainly be descendants of the Catholic Black, Blacks, Irish, and Scotsmen sent to the 13 colonies between 1630 and 1660, who made it with Aboriginal men and women or were adopted by Aboriginal tribes. Here's some actual, these are some actual uh, 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 newspaper items. Here's one right here that was that was published in, in July 1763. One away from the subscriber living in Lancaster, a native a native Irish servant woman named Katie Norton, who came from the county of Wicklow in Ireland last fall. She is about 25 or 26 years of age, of a dark complexion, has black hair, talks in the Irish dialect, rocks in her walk, and is pretty sharp in talking. She's a cunning hussy, and no doubt will pass a while as an honest woman, as she has good clothes with her and can and can behave herself. Whoever takes up said woman and brings her, her to the subscriber in Lancaster shall have three pounds reward. Reasonable charges paid by me, Robert Fulton. Again, you see these Irish slaves. Here's another one from the uh, Virginia, Virginia Gazette. And this is uh this was published uh, between August 10th and through August 17th, 17th. 1739. Runaway, the 8th of July last from subscribers living in Westmoreland County. Four serving men, viz. John McHugh, Francis Mann, Daniel Fritz, Fritz Patrick, and John Freelove. John McHugh is an Irishman of middle stature, swarthy complexion. His hair is his hair is just cut off and is a blacksmith by trade. He has one of the arms bleeding heart pricked with gunpowder and a name at length with several other letters. He had on when he went away a bluish gray coat, breeches, a dowelless shirt, and an old hat. He also took with him a pair of long trousers and an Osnabrig shirt. Francis Mann is an Englishman of a middle stature, swarthy complexion, and short brown hair, and yellowish rotten teeth. Speaks with a quick, full mouth. He's got a little lame and says one of the legs has been broke. He is a blacksmith, a blacksmith by trade. He had on when he ran away a Manx coat vest, you see. Daniel, Daniel Fitzpatrick, an Irishman with broad tongue, is a short, squat named fellow. They described him as swarty. Swarty was another word for black. So you can see many of the slaves who were on those plantations were black Irishmen, see? And so when we look at these people, we say, ah, look at all these slaves. A lot of these people, were, a lot of these blacks weren't slaves. These, a lot of, some of them were free men. Some of them were free black Europeans. But see, but now we know from the research of Dr. Marie Charles, and you can, this is our latest edition. This is the, uh, the, uh, the, the October edition, 2023 issue of MFIT. 
she tells us that we have our, that our surnames didn't come from our masters. And she's absolutely right. There's a book called The Black American Handbook for Survival to the 21st Century. This is a very interesting book. It talks about our Native American heritage, you see. And what what what, she, what the author did in this book is what the author did is that the author recorded. Uh, she went and she looked at the records, you know, from the Dow's list. And see, the Dow's list, in a sense, they recorded, instead of recording, instead of recording the uh, the black tribals as, as, as tribals, they recorded them as freemen, you know. Again, as I told you, the, the European has always tried to make sure that we have no justification for the land. But, you see, when you look at this book and it gives you a list of all the people who belong to the various tribes and their names, in the book, you find, in a sense, Crawford. Yes, Crawford. That Crawford was a, was a common name for many Aboriginal Black people. And we also find that in Ireland, we find the crest of the Crawford. Here's the crest of the Crawford. This crest of the Crawfords, it's found in a sense in, in Dr. Uh, Dr. Marie Childs' book. But can you see? Can you see? You find that many of the Crawfords are listed as Aboriginals. Yes, yes, yes. Know your history. Know that, know that, know that because of the fact that there was so much of an intermixture of, 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 of Black Aboriginals and Irish, Black Irish on those plantations, that a lot of them adopted those names. And you got to remember this. You got to remember this is that, as I told you before, in the 1630s, when they were putting those, when they were putting those Aboriginal, those Aboriginal people on the plantation, many of them were women. Yes, many of them were Aboriginal women or children. And these Aboriginal women, they usually made it with, with the Black Irish who are already, the Black Irish males who are already there. And vice versa. There was there were black Irish men, black Irish women, and we know there were Aboriginal men, but mainly Aboriginal women who were enslaved on the plantations. Another another interesting name is uh, Winters. Mac Ritchie in ancient and modern Britain, he said the Winters of North North Humberland is described by country people who remember him as a tall, powerful man of dark complexion. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, I repeat, the uh, the winners of Ireland, uh, he was a, a, a tall, powerful man of dark complexion. Ah, see, there we see the winner's crest. But wait, 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 what are you talking about, Dr. Winners? But we, when we go to the Black American Handbook of Survival through the 21st century, when we look at, when we look at the list of Aboriginal people, we find that on that list, we find who's find who's surname. Hey, wait a minute, winners. I'm Clyde Winners. Damn, damn, damn. You know, before before I read Dr. Charles's book, you know, before I read Dr. Charles's book, I always imagined that that my uh, that my great grand great grandfather great great grandfather, you know, uh, the father of uh, Clyde uh, Clyde Winners. Who is my grandfather and the father of my and the father of my father's the noble winners? I always felt that that maybe maybe uh, maybe uh, we had uh, we had assumed the name of some German that owned us named named Vienters. So I always said maybe we were Vienters. But see, after reading after reading, you know, Doctor Charles's book, now I see that hey, my name goes back to some of the Black Irish that were sold over here as slaves. And just maybe, maybe my, maybe I didn't get my my surname from my master. Maybe I got the surname from my Black Irish ancestors who made it with the Aboriginal Choctaws and other Indians, Cree and all that, who lived in, who lived there. Because I think I think in the uh, book in the book in the American history book, uh, she uh, lists as uh, the winners, and she lists as the winners under the uh, under the I think it was the Cherokee. But I know that my mother on her side they were Choctaw. So. So we were winners, Choctaw too, and see because of this in it, this mixture. See, see, I, we've been we've been told a lie. We've been told a lie that all of our ancestors only came from Africa. That's a lie. That is a lie, and our surnames is a testimony to our to our Black European Aboriginal Sub-Saharan African origins. 
in conclusion, Weiss, Weiss brought their, in summary, Weiss brought their hate of black elites in Europe over to the United States. When these whites discovered Americans were black Indians, they refused to respect black Indians. To form a buffer group between blacks, blacks and Indians, white gave favor to the mongoloid red Indians who were made honorary whites. Whites took black Indian land and labeled them colored people, just like the enslaved Africans. Due to life on the plantation and life in the colored community, black Indians and former slaves evolved into foundational black Americans. Yes, yes, yes. Maroons and black Indians had intimate relations. The black Indians often adopted maroons in their communities and maroons built their communities in the badlands and swamps where they protect their families. European settlers have been trying for years to separate FBA from the land. Black Native Americans who were sold into slavery lost their nationality when settler administrators changed their birth certificates and other records from native to Negro. Here's an example. The best example is Virginia. We know that in Virginia, this is where they instituted a policy of changing all the records. They went back and changed all the records. Any, 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 any FBA who was a native, they changed their record and said they were Negroes instead, you see. And this was all began in Virginia. One of the uh, one of the greatest, the greatest enemies of, of, of black native people was Walter Ashby Plecker. Employing Virginia's act to preserve racial integrity. In 1924, Plecker effectively separated Virginia citizens into two simplified racial categories, white and color. See, again, we get this color thing. See, see, a lot of times when you when you look at the uh, records and you look at the uh, the growth in the color, the colored people, a lot of times when you say, damn, the colored people, they were they were increasing over time. It wasn't that that people were being freed from 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 slavery, chattel slavery. What it was is that every time they took the land from 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 the black Indians, the Aboriginal Indians, they they decided and called them colored people. See, because they were still in their land. You see, Plecko effectively separated Virginia citizens into two simplified racial categories: white and color. The law, which remained in effect until 1967, when it was overturned by the United States Supreme Court in the case of Loving versus Virginia required that a racial description of every person be recorded at birth while criminalizing marriages between, between whites and non-whites. Although people like Plecker sought to divorce us from the land, FBA have continued to teach their children the love of the land and nature generally. Like my father, my father, he taught me the love of the land. When I was growing up, he would uh, rent land out in the suburbs and we would grow the three sisters. We would grow corn, you know, beans, squash, and uh, tomatoes and okra every year. My father wanted to do this. But but you got to remember this, my people. You got to remember this. Some of the worst atrocities that happened to our people took place during the slavery era on the plantations. It ranged from breeding farms where male and female relatives were forced to have sex and reproduce to the rape, murder, and killing of men, women, and children. On the plantations, the Black people who were made, made POWs after fighting Europeans and forced into slavery were reduced below animals and suffered the worst fate known to man. They were always beating our women. They boiled us and on every plantation. Look at that third picture, at the, that third picture on the left-hand side at the bottom. As, as you see on every plantation, they either had a black man with a stake. They would sometimes get the strongest black man, they would get a stake and they would, they would, nail, they would nail that stake, that stake. They would get a hammer. They would nail that stake from his, from his ass all the way up and come out his mouth. Or they usually, in a sense, had rotting heads on poles on every plantation. Yes. 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 Slavery. Slavery was not nice. Slavery was terrible. But even though we went through all these experiences, even though we suffered terribly, even though white supremacy has been our enemy and has always worked to destroy us, look at it. Yet, even though we are POWs and have suffered much abuse, hate and racism, at the hands of our oppressors. As a result of white supremacy, we remain the worldwide symbols of morality due to the character of our heroines and heroes. Ida B. Wells, she, she made the world aware of how they were, how they were, you know, hanging our people down south. Harriet Tubman, she fought in the Civil War. Yes, she fought in the Civil War. She helped free black people, not only in a sense during the uh, during the uh, during the uh, the, 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 the various 
migrations when she when she stole slaves away from plantations. She also fought in the war. She led a she led a special forces group that fought many Europeans, took save many black people. And Fannie Lou Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer, she came from Mississippi, the, the the home of my parents, and she spoke up. She fought. She was whipped. She was beaten. She was treated very horribly, but they couldn't shut her mouth. They couldn't stop her from speaking and demanding our rights. And of course, our, our hero, our hero, Malcolm X. Malcolm X, he said, treat us right. Fight for your right. And Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, he's the one who told us who we were. He's the one who told us where we came from. And my hero, Paul Robeson. I love Paul Robeson because he played football and I played football. And I felt that football made me the man I am today because football taught me that when you get knocked down, get your ass up and keep on fighting, baby. I thank, I thank God. Thank you for the women in my life. Here you see my mother on the, on the left-hand side, then my mother-in-law in the middle. And there's my granny, Lucinda Winters. I love this old lady. She's, I used to go over her house, and, and her and A. Mabel, they would fix me beautiful meals, and, and they would just shower, shower me with affection. You know, you see, I thank God for my fathers. On the left hand, on the left hand side is my father, Zenoba. And on the right hand side is Nathan. Nathan is my father-in-law. He was the uh, father of my wife. I, I, I respect these men a lot, you know, especially Nathan. Because without Nathan, I wouldn't have my beautiful wife. Oh, la, la, my wonderful one. I thank God for my kids. Yeah, thank you, God, for my kids. I thank you for my daughters. I thank you for my nieces and nephews, and I, but I, I I just love the fact that 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 I do have children, and they married and they married some some wonderful women, and these women are my daughters. Yeah, I mainly had sons, and I, in a way, I was a little mean to my wife because I always I always wanted to make boys instead of girls. I thought I knew how to make boys, so I made boys mainly. I made uh you know five sons and one daughter, but again, in a sense, I love all of them, and I thank my wife for giving me. These uh, these these children, and I thank, in a sense, these girls who, who who married my sons, and they treat me with respect, and they show me deep love. Thank you, and I thank you, God, especially for my wife. You know, my wonderful one. It was my wonderful one who taught me how to love mankind. It was my wonderful one who gave me the children that I that I'm going to to see today, and we're going to celebrate, you know, uh, Thanksgiving, and we're going to eat a nice meal, and we're going to. We're going to, in a sense, thank God that we're still together, that we love each other. And that's what it's all about. But I learned love from my wonderful one. Yes, my wife, Susan Diane Thomas. She was my wife. She became Susan Diane Winters. And she, in a sense, taught me how to love. She taught me what love is. And she taught me that it was through love of a Black woman that you gain grace. It's through love of a Black woman that you gain mercy. It's through love of a Black woman that your life is happy. And she made me happy every day until she died. And I thank God for my grandson, Khalil. You know, he is the future. Yes, Khalil is the future with his little ass. You see? You know, he's our hope. He's our dream. And I thank God. I thank God for blessing me with faith in the Almighty. As a result, I can be lonely, but I am never alone. Do you know what that means? You see? God doesn't allow everybody. Everybody has to play their role. Some people had to be demons and devils and evil. And then other people, God allowed it to, to know he exists and to worship him. And I'm so happy that God allowed me to, to learn that God exists. You know, because, see, sometimes I feel lonely. I felt lonely sometimes even with my wonderful one. And she was the best friend that I could ever hope for and ever have. And she was the best wife and mother of my children. But I sometimes felt lonely. But even though today I feel lonely because I miss her terribly, and I mean, I have a lot of things that I'm blessed with. And that number one blessing is to know God. And because by knowing God, I'm never alone. Do you know what that means? Do you know what it means to never be alone? Everybody is, is lonely sometimes. But when you know God, you're never alone. You know that there's hope and you know that there's a way for you to be successful. Know thyself. Don't forget, freedom is acquired taste. Yes, you have to have an acquired taste for freedom. You have to want to be free yourself. You see? So don't forget. Never forget we are prisoners of war, POWs. See? They stole us off the they stole of our stole us off our Aboriginal villages and then made us chattel slaves. We fought wars with Oliver Cromwell. 
our black Irish ancestors. They became prisoners of war. In Africa, they would attack African villages and they would kidnap our African parents and they would, and they would in a sense, sell them into slavery. We are prisoners of war. As you can see, the Thanksgiving holiday is problematic. It should be a day to give thanks for our blessings. But in reality, the day was inaugurated for whites to give thanks for their ability to murder hundreds of men, women, and children and make my ancestors slaves. Laser settlers, settlers took away our, our Black Native American heritage and gave it to Mongoloid people. They did this by stealing our land and later changing official records to deny our Black Native American heritage and make it and make us colored or Negro people. Granted, we are all black people and should be proud of our African ancestry. But whites had no right to deny our nationality. We must therefore decide if we should really celebrate this infamous holiday or use it as a day to offer libations to our ancestors and continue to fight for justice and reparations for FBA. These are the references I use to write this. Go to my Patreon to see the slides. As, I, as you know, Every presentation I do, I put my slides in my uh, Patreon. So join my Patreon to, to um, see the slides. It's my Patreon in a sense that allows me, that supports me, and gives me in a sense the money necessary to be able to buy books and articles. You can also send me some cash app if you wish. Twitter, you can uh, join me on Twitter at Dr. Clyde Winners 8. And uh, lately I've been uh, posting a lot of my, uh, my, uh, my uh, YouTube shorts on my, uh, on my Twitter channel. Uh, you can follow me at TikTok. Go to TikTok.com at Clyde Winners 3. And, uh, you know, follow me on, a, on, on my TikTok channel. On my TikTok channel, you know, because of the uh, work of uh, Yoshi Ma, you know, and uh, and some other brothers, you know, my video, my videos on TikTok, they number in viewing over 5,500,000. So that's pretty good. You can, uh, you can check out my uh, videos on YouTube right here on this channel. Subscribe right now. Push that like button. Take a minute. Push that like button. If you like the video, like it. Put a like. Put a like down there. You can order my books at Amazon.com. Uh, some of the books that can help you to understand about the history of blacks in America are We Are Not Just Africans, Black History Gems Volume One. Get that book and History of Blacks in Ancient America from Prehistory to 1877. These books will explain to you the history of black people in the Americas. A lot of my Aboriginal brothers say, Dr. Winners, I wish you and David Imhotep would stop calling us black. But brother, sister, we call you black because that's the only, that's the only way we know about the copper colored people. They would say that, 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 that the Americans were copper colored people who they described as black. That's why we know that you existed. So that's why I call you black. It's not to hurt your feelings. It's not, it's not, it's not in a sense to, to perpetuate your inferiority complex that you acquired from, from, from catching caves, culturally acquired identity, immune deficiency syndrome. No. They described our Aboriginal ancestors as black because I knew it was black Indians. Come on now. If you want to find out more about the foundational black Britons, the Baradanaks, get my books, Blacks in Europe, from prehistory to contemporary times or my book, The World History of the Black Race, where I discuss all the black races that existed on every continent. And get my book, Manufactured Genetic Origins, The Fake Eurasian Back, Back Migration. This book talks about how Caucasians lie about their origins and how they really came from Central Asia, that they didn't always live in Europe because Europe was a black continent. And, uh, I'd like you to listen to this. Yoshi Mott, he produced my videos. And uh, you guys, in a sense, if you want to get, if you want to set your website or your or your small business on fire, you better check out check out Yoshi Mott Productions. Yoshi Mott Productions, we're here to take your brand and creativity to new heights. From EPGs to AI commercials, animated music commercials to animated AI bios, book covers to picture flyers, and so much more, you've got you covered. Our team is dedicated to delivering high quality, cutting edge designs that leave a lasting impression. And for our valued clients, 
We offer exceptional creativity, a customer-centric approach, and work that reflects the latest trends and technologies. Just about making art, we're about creating experiences. Your brand, your vision, our artistry. Professionalism and reliability are the cornerstones of everything we do. We're more than a service, we're your creative partners. If you're ready to make your brand shine, look no further than Yoshimod Productions. Join us in the journey of creativity. Contact us today and let's make your vision a reality. Okay, so again, uh, I hope that uh, I hope those of you who want to uh, who want to make your business and take it to the next level, I hope that you'll uh, check out Yoshima Production because uh, you know the brother has a lot that he can help you with, and he can uh, help your help you to be more successful. You know, all the way free. Uh, you know, uh, nice seeing you, Nita Williams, the drew uh, the drew the enlightened darkness. You know, Cordial Holder, Nessie Blake. And TD Summer, welcome to all you guys. Okay, it's not uh we got a it's not uh five o'clock yet. So uh, are there any questions? If you got any questions, put it in the chat, and I'll try to see if I can answer your questions. We'll stay on at least till around five uh, five p.m. So put your question in the chat if you have a question. Well, uh, again, as I said, is that uh, this uh, video was to deal with the bloody Halloween. Is that because Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is is a time that was based on blood, as, as the uh, as the as the governor of Massachusetts said, it was based on a sweet sacrifice. You see, it was it was based on a sweet sacrifice. They feel Europeans, Caucasians feel that whenever they kill us off, you see, whenever whenever they whenever they kill us, it's like a sacrifice. It's like it's like they feel in a sense that when they murder us, that they're showing praise to God. They feel that through this praise to God, that they will get blessings. But no, they won't get any blessings. They're not going to get it. Uh, it's calm. Is uh, Nita Williams? Nita Williams has an interesting question. She said, "Is karma upon Europe? The countries are fail are failing. Uh, in a way, it does look as though karma is on Europe." But but you have to understand in a sense is that they have that they're not that their populations aren't growing, and uh, they're declining. And uh, if you notice over the summer they had very terrible weather, you know Germany because of the fact that Germany uh, supported Ukraine now they're being they're becoming almost in uh, bankrupt with high inflation. So in a way it does look like karma is affecting them. You have to remember in a sense is that karma karma is deep, and what it is is that some of the things that we do to people that are nasty. Some things that we do to people that are mean, sometimes there are punishments. Like the greatest punishment in America was the Civil War. During the Civil War, during the Civil War, for the first time in history, slaves, for the first time in history, 200,000 slaves were allowed, in a sense, to fight against their masters. You see, you know, the European, the, America was losing the Civil War. And they were losing the Civil War because of the fact that in a sense they didn't have troops. And so 17,000, 20,000, 15,000 former slaves, they joined, they joined the Union Army and they fought and they defeated the, the, the Confederates, you see? If it wasn't for black people joining the war, if it wasn't for black people fighting, we wouldn't be free. See, that's why when people tell you that, that Abraham Lincoln gave us our freedom, no, Caucasians have never given us anything. Everything we got, we had to fight for it. We got our freedom because the fact is that we served in the Civil War. Two hundred thousand strong fought in the various units that 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 decimated, you know, the uh, the, the Confederates. Another two hundred thousand black people they followed and they helped maintain the basis 
of the Union troops. See, you just think about this. How can I, how can I not be proud to be a foundational Black American? How can I, I not be proud of my heroes? Harriet Tubman. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and all those people that fought in the Civil War. We are a great and unique people. And we're great and unique people because we're the only people on the face of this earth. We're the only people on the face of this earth that fight white supremacy. We're the only people on the face of this earth, even though we have no guns and no tomahawk, we still fight for right. We still seek justice. You know? We even fight for other people. I mean, it was. I was. I'm a teach. I, I was a teacher for about 46 years in the Chicago public schools. We freed South Africa. How did we free South Africa? We we freed South Africa. We freed South Africa by by in a sense demanding that our unions and our pension funds stop in a sense stop supporting businesses in South Africa. And the South Africans had to had to give the uh, brothers freedom. See. We did that. Yes, foundational Black Americans did that. We love all people. But when we get ready to fight, we be serious about it, see. We are the real Pan-Africanists. But you don't see any African nations and no other nation on the planet Earth is trying to protect us, trying to help us, trying to fight for us. But we fought for everyone else, you see. It's time we fight for ourselves, you see. We are FBA. Uh, this is off the topic. Yeah, I'm familiar with Anthony Browder. He's been out. He he's been working on he's been working on on some uh, excavations in Egypt. But I'm still waiting to see a report. You know, it's very interesting that he's been working on there working there all these years and he hasn't published a report yet on his findings. But yes, I know Anthony Browder. Uh, here's another question. And uh, they ask, um, Halloween, is there a correlation between Thanksgiving and Halloween? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because see, uh, Halloween, you know, Halloween was, was a day to allow to allow uh, Europeans to go about being wild and, you know, act strange, you know, stuff like that. Thanksgiving, it was a different day. It was a day that, that, that Caucasian celebrated the murder of uh, Black people and uh, the decimation of our tribes. You know. So, but again, but again, it's very important to understand is that is that the uniqueness of foundational Black Americans is that we fight, we fight. See, when I was growing up, I once had a fight, and uh, my brother came home and he said, uh, "Clyde," he said, "Mama, uh, Clyde, uh, Clyde, he, he let this boy beat him up," and my mother said, "said Eugene, you take Clyde out tomorrow, and Clyde, you better fight." He said, he said, she, he said, she said, you better fight him back. You see, or I'm going to whip your ass. So I went out and I, and I fought the guy. She didn't say go kill a brother, but she said you have to fight. And that's why we begin in a sense to fight. You know, we, that's why we begin to fight, you know, and uh, here's another thing. Aren't African people the first people everywhere? Yeah, we were the first people everywhere because see, Africa was formerly a place with, with, with lakes and streams. In fact, in fact, many people don't even understand that that Africa, Africa is only a thousand miles, a thousand miles between Brazil and Africa. Can you imagine that? A thousand miles, see? And so then that's no way. And see, we always were selling, we're always adventurers. You know, we we forget sometimes in a sense, we forget that 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 we forget. That uh, that that we were a uh, selling people. They tried to teach you that we were land lovers. They tried to teach you that we never wanted to uh, we never wanted to go and 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 travel around the world. Yes, you see, we wanted to travel around the world too. You know, and that's very important. Excuse me for a minute. <laughs> Yeah. 
my battery was running low. <clears throat> but yes, we were on every continent. Uh, it says, uh, <clears throat> do you have a book on how to do primary research? Yes. I have a book on Amazon.com. It's called, uh, it's, a, it's my research book. I use it for my research class. And uh, this book would tell you how to be how to do primary research. It tells you how to write, how to uh, form a hypothesis. It, it tells you how to form an, uh, you know, in a uh, theory. It, it tells you how to do research. It tells you how to understand and read linguistic articles, anthropological articles, and all these varied articles. So yes, you can uh, buy my uh, my book on conducting research. You can buy it at Amazon.com. All my books are published by Amazon.com. And you can purchase them at, Am at Amazon.com. Um, so you can get my research book there. You know, uh, on the uh, on December 10th, uh, I'm working with Afro Elite, and we're going to do an, uh, a book signing at uh, at the uh, at the library on 48th and Michigan in Chicago, Illinois, on uh, on December 10th. If you have any of my books, if you have any of my books that you want signed, bring them out that day to the uh, library on 48th and uh, Michigan on uh, December 10th, and I'll sign them. Plus, I have a few books there that you can buy. So, if you're interested in uh, learning learning about this, then it, then uh, you may want to uh, do that. Here's a question that I think is interesting. This question is from uh, what is it? Uh, Jetty Lamar, I think it is. It said that would make that would make the day similar. Halloween is the day of the dead, or in a cult perspective, Thanksgiving is celebrating death. Yeah, it is. You, you're in, in a way you are right, Jetty Lama. Lama, you are absolutely right. They, they are celebrating. They are celebrating our murder. So yes, it is. And so you have this dichotomy. On the one hand, you have Europeans who celebrate Thanksgiving as a time to murder us, as a time to destroy us, as a time to, to, to take us away because they feel they're going to gain sacrifice. They're going to gain, in a sense, a blessing from God by murdering us. We, on the other hand, we see Thanksgiving as a day of celebration. Uh, we see Thanksgiving as a day to think about all of our blessings over the past year. So yes, yes, it, it is this dichotomy. But this dichotomy is one in which you have to understand is that we see Thanksgiving based upon love, whereas they see Thanksgiving based upon sacrifice, the sacrifice of black people. Very interesting. Okay, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's getting pretty close to five o'clock. If there aren't any uh, any more questions, then I'll uh, probably end the, in this uh, particular uh, this uh, this uh, live broadcast. Remember, remember, uh, check out uh, Yoshimod. Yoshimod can take your production. He can take your website. He can take your small business to the next next level. I'm telling you, telling you, if you want to make some money, you need to get this man. You saw, you saw the video that I began the program with that was made by Yoshimod. I've already shown you what he can do for your company. So therefore, in a sense, make sure that you check this brother out. Make sure that you uh, write him and he'll get his team to work right away to make your company the best company possible. Take care. Have a great, have a great uh, Thanksgiving. Love you, family. Bye.